Hello and welcome all. First of all, all the best from my side for your results. I'm Dr. Ankit Elenotmi, faculty for LNX platform and here we are here to have a quick recall on the INICT May 2023 exams. Elenotmi participated by me. Let's start the session. First question over here is asking us, uh, given us bone over here and is asking us about a clinical scenario. He's saying that the patient is unable to flex the interphalangeal joints of the ring and little finger. So this ring and this little finger are unable to flex the interphalangeal joints. Fine. And also would not hold the paper between all the four fingers. So holding the paper between the fingers of oh, this is a paper over here. This is now we are unable to hold the paper between the fingers. Paper is getting slipped away. Which of the following labeled areas of humerus could have been damaged? So if you look at the scenario, unable to flex the IP joints of these two fingers. Here we know that the FDS and FDP they go into these fingers. But FDP is a hybrid muscle and the medial half of FDP is supplied by the ulnar nerve. Right, so that could be damaged. Plus they're also saying that the paper is slipping away from between the fingers. It means that the palmar introsia, which causes adduction of the fingers, that is not working. So palmar introsia itself is supplied by the ulnar and the middle half of FDP is supplied by the ulnar So it gives an idea that okay, ulnar might have been involved over here. But here the question has a next catch. Catch is they are not giving an option like ulnar or any other nerve. They are asking you which labeled area could have been damaged. So if you look over here, the humerus is an interior view of the humerus over here. Right, there's an anterior view, and on the other side of it, you are seeing the posterior view of the humerus. So, point A is pointing towards a part of the humerus, and this point of the humerus is the surgical nerve of humerus. A very important nerve lies over here, which is the axillary nerve. So, point A would be referred to the axillary nerve, right? So, this refers to the axillary nerve over here. Okay, if you come to the point B, point B is the lower end of the humerus, and there are two epicondyles. Point B is referring to the Slightly less projected out, that is the lateral epicondyle over here, while point C is referring over here to the medial epicondyle. Right? And point D is showing us a shaft of the humerus, but on the posterior aspect, so that is around the spiral groove over here. A very important nerve is located around the point D, and which nerve is that? That nerve is our radial nerve. So that nerve is our radial nerve. So point D is basically radial nerve. Point A is about the axillary nerve. Point B, no specific nerve, but anterior to it. There's some fibers of radial nerve that may pass in front of radialis, so not exactly. But yes, point C, middle epicondyle, and just behind the middle epicondyle, on touch with periosteum, here we have the answer that is the ulnar nerve. So in this clinical scenario, we have to find out first of all which nerve is involved. That would have been ulnar nerve. Then second thing is which are the which the ulnar nerve passes very close to which bone, and uh, Lucky to say that these things we have already discussed many times in our classes and also in our lectures. Have a look at this particular image. This image is showing us the humerus and the three and the three nerves which are closely associated with the periosteum. Here you see the axillary nerve over here on the surgical neck. Here you see the radial nerve in the radial groove behind. And here this was the answer of the last in this exam. All the nerve passing behind the medial epicondyle. This nerve you can actually feel it also just go behind the medial epicondyle. So answer over here is our option number C. Answer for this question is option number C over here. Let us see one more over here. Again, famous question, I mean, repeated question, repeated topics, question may or may not be repeated. But yeah, this looks like repeated. Which of the following are supplied by the superior glutal nerve? The superior glutal nerve with the root value of L4, L5, S1 is a branch from the sacral plexus. All can say the lumbosacral plexus because L4 is also involved. And it is very important for our tendon and well skate. Right, and then the sign and gate. So, the muscle supplied by the glute nerve always gluteus, medius, and minimus. But apart from these two, it also supplies a very small muscle that is a tensor facial lata. If you look at these options, obviously the answer is straightforward. That is A, B, and D. So, you have to choose from the four options given below. So, look for A, B, and D. I hope like we can very well see the option of B over here. It's having three options A, B, and D, which have the gluteus, medius, and minimus, the chief A, B ductus, and the tensor facial lata attached to the Iliotibial tract, right? So these are the three muscles supplied by the superior glute nerve. Now there are also a lot of asked about the tendon and so get ready for that too. And the gluteus maximus, if they ask, that is supplied by the inferior glute nerve, right? This piriform is over here, it's coming from the later part of the sacrum, going through the greater sciatic notch, attaching to the greater canter of the femur. It is directly supplied by the sacral plexus nerves. Now here's a cadaveric image showing you the gluteal region of the left side. This over here, this over here is the piriformis over here. This is the piriformis. And this is the gluteus minimus. This is the gluteus minimus overlapped by gluteus medius. And most over here you have this that will be known as the gluteus max maximus. So this is our gluteus maximus, right? This is the gluteus medius and that is the gluteus minimus over here. So these, this is the piriformis and the nerves coming above the piriformis over here. Let me show you the different color. 
the nerves coming just above the piriformis, the nerve in the vessels over here, these all would be the superior glute nerve vessels. And as you can see, the, where are they going? They are going towards the medius and minimus over here. Okay, so do remember this point that the nerve supply of these muscles is very, very important because of the Tannenberg sign and the gait. And questions do come from here. Here, if you might see this nerve over here, that might also be asked. This is the sciatic nerve, which is, as you must be knowing, the thickest nerve in the body. Right. So question over here, and the answer is option number B. Let us see one more. One of my favorite questions is the following from lateral to medial. According to the structures present at the floor of the fourth ventricle. Uh, these are the four cranial nuclei. So already we keep on saying that cranial nuclei is very, very important, very, very important. And yes, indeed it is. And here you are seeing a different sort of question. So you have to keep your eyes and mind open all the time while reading or learning anything through our lectures also. This is discussed in our LN next in detail. So what is lateral to medial now? We have this basic formula. What is that? In brain stem, M is for medial and M lies the motor nerve. So more medial are the motor nerves. Motor means efferents. So we're going to lateral to medial. More medial will we be having options number A and option number C. These will be more medial. So A and C will be. So choose between these two options because A and C over here are more medial. So we have to go from lateral to medial. These are more medial. So it will be either DVC or BDC. Now, most medial will be the pure motor nerves. What are the pure motor cranial nerves? If these are motor nerves number 3, number 4, number 6 and number 12 and number 12. Okay. These are the four pure motor nerves. 3, 4, 6 and 12. Right. So 3, 4, 6 and 12 are the pure motor nerves. Okay. And these come under which cranial nerve uh, nuclear column? They come under the general somatic efferent over here. So general somatic efferent option number A is most medial. Option number A this is actually most medial. Therefore, we can go with option number B as the answer over here. Why? Because in option number B over here, you can see that option number A is present most medially. So this gives an idea. So here we have the most lateral is the vestibular cochlea. That is the spatial somatic afferent is most lateral because the pure sensories are most lateral. Then you have another sensory that is general somatic afferent having the fifth nerve nuclei. That is option number B. Then you have the spatial vessel efferent, that is the pharyngeal arches, and finally you have the GSE, the pure motor supplying the muscles of tongue and the extraocular muscles. Right. So answer over here will be our option number B. Point to be clear. And next, see an image over here talking of that too. This is showing us the right half of the brain stem, and probably you can see over here the part of the midbrain over here. Right. Then a pons over here, and below you can go with the medulla oblongata M over here. Most laterally, you have this vestibular cochlear These are a spatial somatic afferent. And most immediately, you have this red colored over here. That is a somatic efferent supplying the muscles of tongue and the extraocular muscles. And these are 3, 4, 6, 12. And between them lies all these. So this is the track over here going from medial to lateral. Or you can say from lateral to medial. Right. So more medially, you have the efferent ones. Efferent ones are present more medially. And they have afferent ones are present more laterally. And therefore, this was a beautiful question which we hinted. A lot of times that this is a question that might come and so happy to see it. Okay. And all the best for you who, who did it correct. Okay. Let's see another one. Okay. Again, like most of the times they ask us, uh, they give us an image and uh, they show us a muscle. And but nowadays they are asking their actions as well. So initially they used to just ask the name. What's the function of these muscles? So identify these muscles over here. The diagram like this was shown. But you can see over here in this image, there is a medial border of the scapula. There is over here a medial border of the scapula over here, right? This is a medial border of the scapula. So a uh, muscle is coming from the medial border of the scapula going to the spinous processes in the midline. These are the rhomboids, right? The lower one will be the rhomboid major and the upper one will be the rhomboid minor. So this will be your MI. MI is the rhomboidus minor over here. So they are pointing out towards rhomboidus major or minor. Now, why are they asking their functions or actions? I have said it a lot of times and I will keep on saying it until everyone of us gets to the point that don't cram the action of any of the muscles. Remember just one thing that when the muscle will contact, what will happen to the bone associated with it? Now see this muscle, red color muscle. If it contracts, will it move the whole spine laterally? Can it? Answer is no. Can it move the whole scapula, medial border of scapula? Medially? Answer is obviously yes. That action is known as retraction of the scapula. Therefore, the action of this muscle is a retraction of the scapula. Retraction of the scapula is also known as adduction of the scapula, A double D. Retraction of the scapula is also known as adduction of the scapula. Adduction of the scapula. Opposite of this, opposite of this will be done by the muscles. 
which are basically your serratus anterior and pectoralis minor, they will do protraction of the scapula. So this rhomboid is minor major, they will cause retraction or adduction of the scapula that is a function mainly of the of the rhomboidus minor, rhomboidus major and also don't forget about the middle fibers of trapezius, where can they be? This is the whole triangular muscle trapezius we are seeing on the left side. So this trapezius actually sort of covers these deeper lying rhomboid muscles and these are the middle fibers of trapezius, they also will cause a retraction of the scapula. This action is a retraction of the scapula, bringing both the scapula close to the midline. Okay, so answer is over here. Option number A is the answer. Ele elevated scapula is elevator scapula. Asked two, three years back in knee PG. Pushes glenoid labrum anteriorly, pushes glenoid labrum downward. Anteriorly is same as, same as a pushing punching movement. There is a protraction that will cause by serratus anterior and pectoral spinal muscle. Pushing glenoid labrum downward will be caused by the, basically the weight of the upper limb and the lower fibers of, uh, you can say, the trapezius or some latissimus dorsi as well. Okay, got the point. So identify the muscle and uh, don't cram the action, just think calmly and you will reach the answer. Okay, it's so simple. Okay, beautiful question from the head neck part. Match the correct pair of nerve supply with the corresponding action. So, they are over here, the nerve supplies are given on the left the column, the right column, few actions are shown. You have to identify which is correct. If you have the basic idea of the head and neck, this question is would be should be a cakewalk. Facial, the facial, we all know supplies the facial muscles, so it is known, so it is known as facial nerve. But apart from this, it also has different other branches, which you remember inside the middle ear. One of those branches is the quadratimplina. Quadratimplina carries the taste from the anterior to third of tongue, and also it is the what we say is the parasympathetic motor supply to the submandibular and the sublingual glands. So here you have the taste from the anterior to third of tongue. That is for option number one. Right? Let me change the color so it will be better over here. The second is the branch of spinal axis nerve. The spinal axillary nerve comes out from the jugular foramen and then the spinal one goes posteriorly supplying both the sternocleidomastoid and the trapezius. So yes, the spinal axillary nerve is only a motor function that is to supply the SCM and trapezius. So yes, it involves in the shrugging of shoulders. This is the shrugging of shoulders, right? So that is a oh, option number two over here that we can write. Option number third, the glossopharyngeal is the ninth nerve. Glossopharyngeal is glossomine tongue, pharynx means pharynx. It is basically sensory to both the tongue and the pharynx, which part of tongue? The posterior part of the tongue. It is also sensory to the pharynx. Apart from this, it is also going to supply one lone muscle over there, that is the stylopharyngeus. Okay? But here, glossopharyngeal, then they're giving us the taste from the posterior third. Okay, so we'll go with this. Option number three, no points in guessing. Obviously, option number four should fit over here. It is a mandibular nerve. We all know mandibular chewing, mandibular chewing. So one goes with the D, one D, only, only one option is over here. Best things should fall into place. Two is A, two is A, yes. Three is B, three is B, yes. Four is C, four is C, yes. Okay, so again, I'm telling you head neck, basic cranial nerves. And uh, we have also shared the different topics a couple of days back about the list of most important topics for NICT anatomy, particularly from my side. I hope if you have seen it, these topics were placed over there. So happy to see it, right? Okay. Here's a figure of the tongue showing you the nerve supply. Basically, this is a motor nerve, but we are here focusing only on the sense, mainly on the sensory nerve. See over here, spatial sensory, quadrant tympani, seventh branch, spatial means taste, and glossopharyngeal for the posterior and third is spatial here for the taste, right? Therefore, this is how it will fit over here. Let us see a couple of more questions. Okay, so there was also a question showing us the TS of the medulla or the lower pons, and they talked about the later medulla syndrome as the input we got. Obviously, the Wallenberg syndrome. And there was some artery, there was some artery actually that was shown over here, which was being supplying this area. Okay, so might be some clinical features of lateral medullary syndrome. But luckily, a few of uh, students told us that uh, the artery uh, luckily was labeled over there as the PIC, the pica artery or the pica syndrome. So I hope uh, it won't be causing much trouble to you guys. It would be uh, like a Mm, what we say as a, as a refresher for in our exam, having the question and the answer in front of us. So yes, little medullary syndrome, the Wallenberg, most important vessel, basically vertebral artery or its branch pica that is involved. And the lateral cranial nerves, the lateral tracts are involved over here, mainly 9, 10, 11, so there will be hoarseness. And the uh, spinal thalamic tract is involved, and the spinal tract of trigeminal nerve that is involved. The sympathetics are involved, the cerebellum might be involved, so these things are involved over there. So if there was a clinical scenario, it would have been like this. But remember, if the tongue is involved, the tongue muscles are involved, it would have been a medial medullary syndrome, right? If the tongue muscles are involved, because 12th and R, as we discussed, the motor nerves come from more medial aspect, right? So it would have been a lateral. And pica, already labeled, then uh, what else to say? Okay. Okay. 
Here we have a question. The input came out of the oscillatory point, so we will on the left side. Some question of I am not sure about the other options, or it was A, B, and C in sequence. It was supposed to infer on the left side would be in sequence. But here is the image just to show you guys. This is the image here for the sternum and the costal cartilage, which you can see. And this dark red color over here, these are the actual location, these are the surface marking. I am writing SM over here. These are the surface marking of the walls. This is the pulmonary wall over here. Below it you have the aortic wall. Then you have the mitral wall and then you have the tricuspid wall. So you can see over here that the positioning, the surface marking of walls is just behind the sternum. But over here, if you look at the arrows and this pink circles, they are showing us the auscultatory points. The tricuspid can be both on the right as well as left side over here, right? This is the basic concept over here. This is what we normally hear when you take a stethoscope and you go to the medicine wards or you just look for the heart sound, look for the murmurs in the cardio department, whatever it is. We take our stethoscope, we put it in the uh, location for the mitral wall as the, the location of the apex of the heart. Left of the possible space is below and lead to the nipple around 9.5 centimeter from the midline. So, mitral area is actually the apex B part. The tricuspid area is actually in the left or right fifth intercostal space again. The pulmonary and aortic area, pulmonary is, is on the left side, left second intercostal space, the aortic area is on the right second intercostal space. So, if you have this basic idea, I hope, and you can search for the options and all, and uh, you hopefully have marked it correct in the exam also, all the rest. Okay, there was a question from the um, anatomy of the, so I'm just not uh, riddling that question over there, but there was some question regarding the left hemianopia. Students recalled over there that uh, in the question was written that somewhat on the left side of the visual field was not visual. So always remember that distal to the optic chiasm, distal to the optic chiasm in the optic pathway, there always going to be happening a contralateral hemianopia, right, contralateral hemianopia. So obviously if it is a left hemianopia, the problem will be in the right cortex. And we know about that the uh, occipital cortex is basically the region for the visual area, right? So you can choose your answer from there. That uh, what was the question, and um, little or guess of how it will take cover, uh, care of it, right? Then um, the four so famous question of EMT and uh, the, again the auditory pathway. So again, you see a lot of head, neck, and ear over here. But E. coli MA, we all know from the Dingla book and all, right? So E. coli MA, the E is for eighth, and the numeric is over here, cochlear nucleus, superior olivary, and also this one is. Simpler and a smaller uh, pneumonia, which I use in my classes, slim over here. We have uh, yeah, removed the eighth nerve and cochlea because that you already know. So slim is just like over here, you can super olivary nucleus, this little laminus because the pathway it's not a nucleus, inferior colliculus in the lower part of midbrain posteriorly, and GB is in the thalamus. Right? So this is the uh, E. coli MA, and I guess the sequence might have been asked you in the exam. So I'm sure that most of you must have done it right. If not, then uh, revise it and maybe help you in future okay that was a part of the ent over here so that's all guys on my side i hope you enjoyed any doubts any other uh, corrections you just write in the comment box below so you can sort it out thank you bye bye and all the best for the exam